Thank you very much for joining us. Before we get started on this week's podcast, a really exciting announcement. Peter Hart's book, The Gallipoli Evacuation, is now available to pre-order on our website. That's right, pre-order the book. It'll be out in September, but get your hands on a copy early because anyone who pre-orders the book will also receive an exclusive behind-the-scenes interview with Peter Hart that includes wonderful audio from Gallipoli veterans telling their story in their own words. It's absolutely extraordinary. In many ways, it's even more exciting than the book, but the book's pretty good too. So get your hands on the book, pre-order it now on our website, and get that exclusive interview that you can download straight away, and then you'll get the book when it comes out in September. So Peter Hart's The Gallipoli Evacuation, now available on the Living History website, which is livinghistorytv.com. That website again, livinghistorytv.com. Get your hands on the book. It's going to be something really special. A Living History Production. This is the Living History Podcast. Broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Living History. Now, there's a young bloke called Adam Bloom who has joined me on several tours to battlefields all over the world. And he's doing a lot of stuff to remember the Anzacs. And it's really fantastic to see. We need more young people embracing with this story. We need more young people keeping the history alive. And Adam is a great example of that group of young people that are doing that. And Adam, as part of this effort to keep the memories of the Anzacs alive, has launched his own podcast. It's called True Blue History. And I recommend that you get out there and subscribe to that podcast and listen to it because he's doing some great work. He's getting some excellent historians on there to interview and he's doing some really good stuff. So support Adam and young people who are keeping the Anzac memory alive by listening to True Blue History. And so you get a taste of the good work that Adam's doing. Here's an episode that he and I recorded recently about the Battle of Pozieres. So it's coming up to the anniversary of the Battle of Pozieres, so the timing is excellent. And so I thought I'd bring you this very special episode of the podcast, demonstrate the good work that Adam's doing on True Blue History. And when you finish listening to this, jump onto your favourite podcast app and subscribe to True Blue History because you'll be glad you did. So now it's over to Adam to hear all about the Battle of Pozier. G'day! Welcome to True Blue History. I'm Adam Bloom. Today's special guest is Matt McLaughlin, owner of Matt McLaughlin Battlefield Tours. And he has joined us today to talk about the Battle of Pozier's where 23,000 casualties were sustained in just six weeks of fighting. Hi, Matt. Thanks for joining us on the show. Thanks, mate. Great to be here. Matt, I'd just like to basically start and get a get an overview of where what Pozier is, like where it is, and what we, what we were doing, what was the battle, what were we trying to achieve, and was it a uh, success? Okay, well, the Battle of Pozier, um took place in 1916, in July and August 1916, and the town of Pozier, the village of Pozier, is in the Somme region of northern France. So this is about an hour and a half north of Paris, um, and this was the region where the Battle of the Somme, the very famous Battle of the Somme, was taking place in 1916. So the Battle of the Somme started on the 1st of July, 1916, and Australian troops weren't involved in those opening stages of the Battle of the Somme. Um, and the Battle of the Somme soon turned into this massive action, one of the biggest battles the world had ever seen. And the Australians were drawn in to assist with that battle in later in July, at the 23rd of July, the Australians joined the fight when they attacked at the Battle of Pozier uh, at this little village. And the reason that Pozier was important is it wasn't really anything to do with the village. It was just simply the case that it was the highest point of the ridge on the Somme battlefield known as Pozier Ridge. And so it was really important that the British captured this ridge. So to do that, they had to take the village of Pozier. And I should say at this stage that after years of fighting, there was no village left to be captured. It was merely just a, a moonscape of craters uh, where the village had once been. And so uh, the, uh, it was quite a task for the uh, Aussies to, to come into the line on the 23rd of July and, and capture the ruins of the village and to take the German trenches nearby. Um, yeah, so basically the Australians came into the line on 23rd of July and they fought there for about six weeks. Um, and the battle was successful. They did succeed in capturing the village of Pozier and the surrounding area, uh, but they lost 23,000 men killed or wounded in six weeks of fighting, which makes it the most deadly 
military action Australian troops have ever been involved in. So that's why we remember Posse Air today. If we read through the history and we see the the blockhouse fall to Gibraltar and we... It was there other objectives that weren't reached uh, in while we were in the six weeks of fighting? Um, yeah, there were. I think like any action in the First World War, um, things changed as time went on. So that the main landmarks in the area were... So that there was, as I said, there was no village. In fact, the soldiers said that the only way they could tell where the village had been was because of the, uh, the, the, the earth was slightly redder because of the dust from the bricks of where the village had been. So there was like a red hue on the ground showing where the, where the village had formerly stood. But behind the village were two very large German trenches called OG1 and OG2, in term, meaning standing for Old German, Old German 1 and 2. And behind that was a windmill um, which had stood there for centuries. But by the time of the First World War, the early fighting had absolutely destroyed that windmill. So all that was left was a rough mound with some bricks and some concrete emplacements left on it. So those were the only landmarks on the battlefield. And immediately next to Pozier was a farm called Mukay Farm, or known to the soldiers as Mukau Farm or Mucky Farm, as the Australians called it. And Mukay Farm was, uh, was, was next to Pozier, and that was another one of the objectives that was set for the Australians. Um, and so the fighting... The fighting for Pozier and Mukay Farm is, uh, you can either look at it as one collective action, which is what we do when we say the six weeks of fighting, um, but they're actually quite distinct phases of the battle. So the attack on the village of Pozier and those trenches and the windmill, and then the attack on Mukay Farm. And the Australians were not successful in capturing Mukay Farm. Uh, they basically fought and fought and fought and edged their way forward until they were exhausted after six weeks of fighting and then handed over to the Canadians and the Canadians completed the capture of Mukay Farm. Um, but it was a, an extraordinary achievement, the taking of Pozier, but we remember it just for the the sheer destruction of the Australian forces involved. Um, so to lose 23,000 men in six weeks of fighting just shows you the level of, of intensity that was going on in that uh, very small area. That's that's a great overview. So, how many like how many of our divisions were involved in the battle? There were three divisions. So the first division came in on the twenty third of July, uh, and they only fought for three days. They only fought up until the twenty sixth of July and lost five thousand men in that time. So we remember the first division as the famous division from Gallipoli. Um, they came in, and this was their first major action on the Western Front. Um, they lost five thousand men in only three days of fighting. They were then replaced by the 2nd Division, which came in. The 2nd Division had also served at Gallipoli. Uh, and the 2nd Division fought for another 10 days. So the, basically the 1st Division captured the village, or the ruins of the village, and then pushed on to the, to the area beyond the village. And the 2nd Division then had an absolute slog for 10 days, basically from the edge of the village to these German trenches, the two German trenches I described, and the ruins of the windmill, um, which they succeeded in capturing by early August, and then they had lost nearly 7,000 men in those 10 days. So then they handed over to the 4th Division, who then came in and began the long slog along the ridge towards Mukay Farm and then lost thousands of men as well. And this cycle was repeated. When the 4th Division was worn out, they then brought the, re the remnants of the 1st Division back in. And the 1st Division was replaced by the remnants of the 2nd Division. And then the 2nd Division was replaced again by the 4th Division. So it was just this giant mincing machine, just throwing men back into the into the machine and just edging forward inch by inch, just some of the most gruelling and, and horrific fighting of the war. And the 2nd Division was particularly, um, well, both the 1st and 2nd Division saw Pozier as one of their key achievements of the war, which is why the two key memorials that are, are now at Pozier, one of them is a memorial to the 1st Division, and the other one was originally a memorial to the 2nd Division, but now is more of an Australian uh, memorial to all the Australian troops who fought there. What you've just described, it... It sounds like an absolute slaughter and just it sounds that it was, as you said, just a mincing machine and it was there, obviously there was some heroic acts there. It was Do you know how many v Victoria Crosses were won at Pozier's? I'm trying to remember. I, th I think four, I want to say from memory, um, but that's a... Uh that's uh, that's that's straight off the top of my head from memory. But there were several Victoria Crosses that were won. Arthur Blackburn won a Victoria Cross. Um, Tom um, Private Cook won a Victoria Cross there. Uh, Martin O'Meara, I think, won a Victoria Cross. Um, Claude Castleton won a Victoria Cross for rescuing wounded. I'm trying to think if there was any other Victoria Crosses, but there was a you know the the actions at Pozier um, were just typified by bravery, heroics, just by the Australians achieving you know impossible. 
uh, things in these in these devastating odds. And um, the the thing that's important to remember when we ask why was it so destructive is that. This is late in July. The Battle of the Somme had been going since the first day of July. So three or four weeks later, the battle had actually started to die down in most other areas of the Somme. So the only real fighting that was occurring in that sector was at Pozieres. Therefore, every German artillery crew in the entire area, basically within range, was free to then turn their guns onto Pozieres. So what we remember about Pozieres is the Australians just sheltering in their trenches or in the, in the German trenches that they'd captured and the Germans just raining artillery fire on them. And it was some of the heaviest artillery fire we saw during the First World War. So just horrific stories from the Australians just about not being able to do anything except just, just crouching at the bottom of your trench as a hail of shells came in. Every, you know, every couple of seconds a high explosive shell would land. And that was the most horrific part of the battle. I remember one story about an officer was going down the trench and just checking on his men and just saying, just saying, come on, man, just just hold your nerve, just hold your nerve under this hurricane of fire. And he came across a group of men who were playing, um, who were playing cards. They'd gotten a they'd gotten a box and they were sitting around the box and they were playing cards to try and steady their nerves. And the sergeant that was playing with them was killed by a shell blast. So they just threw his body up on the top of the trench. And another man sat down and took over his hand, and they just kept playing cards. So the officer remembered noting that he went down the trench to check on the other end of the trench. He came back. 10 or 20 minutes later, and all four men had been killed in a shell blast. So it's just this horrific rain of shell fire just on these poor blokes just huddled in the bottom of these trenches and there was nothing they could do about it. When you're describing that, the hair on my neck stands up. That is just... I now see why so many... There was... Well, so many men were killed and why there were so many casualties. And so you hear of the British on the first day of the Somme, how they lost 60,000... You could say that they're at well, really, apart from going away to for Mel, that this really was our sort of the same as the British. Our losses were terrible. Yeah, it certainly was. I mean, this is the most costly battle Australia has ever fought in from any war, not just the First World War, but from every war. This is the most costly battle Australia has ever fought in. And it's interesting that you mentioned from El, the other big action that Australia is known for from that period of 1916, July 1916. Um, and Fromel is known as the worst 24 hours in Australian military history when we lost 5,500 men in that one battle a bit further to the north. And so what it means is that combined, the men that we lost, the nearly 30,000 men we lost um, is, you know, in those, is those first two battles is more than we lost in the Gallipoli campaign. So more men died in the first two battles on the Western Front than we lost in the entire eight months at Gallipoli. So it's just extraordinary, um, just the, the, the level of death and destruction that, that went on on the Western Front compared to what had happened at Gallipoli. I've actually got a, I'll, if, if you don't mind, I've got a quote here from one of the soldiers that was there, which might shed a little bit of light on what it was like to be at Pozier. So Absolutely, mate. Yeah, that'd be great. So this is a quote from um, Second Lieutenant John Rawes from Melbourne, uh, and he was in the 23rd Battalion, so in the, uh, in the 2nd Division. Uh, and this is his, uh, his quote about what it was like to be at Pozier. All is buried and churned up again and buried again. The sad part is that, that one can see no end to this. If we live tonight, we have to go through tomorrow night and next week and next month. Poor wounded devils you meet on the stretchers are laughing with glee. One cannot blame them. They are getting out of here. We are lousy, stinking, ragged, unshaven, sleepless. I have one putty, a dead man's helmet, another dead man's gas protector, a dead man's bayonet. My tunic is rotten with other men's blood and partly spattered with a comrade's brains. So Rawls wrote that in early August from Pozier, uh, and he was killed in the advance on Mouquet Farm on the 23rd of August. So he wrote that two weeks before he was killed himself. Oh, I'm, nearly, I'm nearly shedding a tear listening to that. That is just, it's, it's heartwarming, and it just, oh, it's just, you just hear that, Matt, and you, these men absolute bravery that what they did i'm choking up harrowing stories like that that makes it really does i can see why you study the first world war and and why posiers is such a it's such a key battle that australians do remember and uh, from stories that are just like that yeah it is really one of those battles that you you can't help but be touched by um it's just uh, it's just the nature of the fighting at Pozier, and it's always been one of the actions that I mean, the favourite is not the right word, but it's always been a, a battle that's that has really affected me emotionally. And one of the things I've noticed in my research is that Pozier was a real dividing line 
for the service of men in the in the Australian Imperial Force in the First World War. So what you tend to find is that there's there's two distinct groups of men in general: the men that fought up until Pozier, and then the men who fought after Pozier, because so many were killed and wounded at Pozier that was really a dividing line. Um, in, in, in the service of the AAF. And I mean, you, you obviously see men who served from Gallipoli throughout the war. Obviously, there are exceptions. But I'm always amazed at how many people you see either served in that first group, served at Gallipoli, and then the early battles on the Western Front, and then were killed or wounded at Pozier, and the group of men who then enlisted at, after Pozier and then fought on through 1917 and 1918. It's really quite extraordinary the effect this one battle had. Well, we had three divisions there, and half the men who fought there were killed or wounded in the fighting at Pozier. So you're talking, you know, as we said, we're talking 23,000 out of probably 45,000 men who fought there were killed or wounded. So just extraordinary the effect that had on the Australians as a whole. Oh, ab- absolutely. So of the survivors, if they were lucky to survive, Matt, what did they, obviously they went back in again and in after they had a bit of rest. And so what came of the battle once once the six weeks was over? Well, it was pretty important. I mean, we handed over the Canadians and they completed the capture of Mukay Farm by the end of September. Uh, and it was pretty important in the, the sort of stepping stone of the Battle of the Somme because it's hard to describe without looking at a map, but there's a long ridge. And at one end of the ridge is Pozier and at the other end of the ridge is a village called Tiepval. And Tiepval was absolutely crucial on the first day of the Somme fighting. The, the British expected to capture it in the early hours of the battle. As it was, it took them months and months and months. It took them four months to capture Tietval, as it happened. And today, Tietval, as the centre of some of the toughest fighting of that Somme battle, um, is where the great British memorial to the missing from the Somme is, the Tietval Memorial, the huge red brick, absolutely stunning memorial. Um, so that's at Tietval because Tietval was so important. So if you imagine that Pozier is at one end of a ridge and Tietval is at the other, the British, at the start of the Battle of the Somme, were trying to come up the ridge, just attacking Tietval head-on, and were absolutely wiped out trying that. So what they did is they changed tactics. And after the Australians and then the Canadians succeeded in capturing Pozier and Mukay Farm, the British then used that as a, a stepping off point to then attack along the top of the ridge, uh, which they were able to do. And then so by November, they had actually completed the capture of Tietval and a number of other key points along that ridge. So yes, it was important to the very important to the outcome of the Battle of the Somme. And the Battle of the Somme was very important. But the, the amazing thing is when you walk this ground today or drive this ground it's so tiny you know it takes to get the road from Pozier to Tietval would take four five six minutes to make that drive from the village of Pozier to the Tietval memorial um, and that's your crossing land that took the British four months to capture and cost probably oh, literally hundreds of thousands of men were killed or wounded on both sides to just complete that um that, that short little advance. So like so many things in the First World War, yes, it had a very valid purpose in the context of what they were trying to achieve during that war. But today, when we look back on it, you just think, you know, at what cost to take these uh, these tiny little villages? Yeah, exa- exactly right. It, so overall, of your opinion, was the historians claim that the Somme was a victory? Are, are, you in, like, are you in that group as well that you do say it is a victory? Yeah, it's a, it's a controversial question. The, the Battle of the Somme went from the 1st of July until, um, until November. So it was basically four months of some pretty tough fighting. And it, depends, it really depends which way you look at it. It certainly, it certainly wasn't the victory the British wanted it to be. The British and French, we shouldn't forget the French, who also fought very strongly on the Battle of the Somme. The British and French thought this was going to be the battle that ended the First World War. After two years of fighting, they thought, this is it. This is the battle that's going to win it for us. And the plan was to bust through the German lines and to get cavalry in behind the Germans and to really roll up the German line and, and, and effectively destroy the German army in that, uh, in that part of the battlefield. Um, just on that subject as well, a lot of people dismiss the idea that cavalry um, would have been used in the Battle of the Somme, but that overlooks the fact that cavalry was really the only mobile force that was available. And so as long as machine guns and artillery were taken out of action by the infantry, the cavalry could, act, could have been very, very effective um, in that area, as they were in various parts of 1918, the cavalry did great work. Um, so that was a little aside, but the, the the plan to get the cavalry through a gap in the line and to ride up and down the German lines causing havoc was actually quite a good one. Um, it's just that the infantry could not succeed at the um, the task of breaking through the German lines. So in terms of what the Allies wanted to do, the British and French, no, the Somme did not achieve what they set out to do. And it became that very sinister 
phrase, a battle of attrition, which basically was invented because of the Somme fighting, the idea that instead of a big breakthrough, it would now be a battle of attrition, just grinding, grinding, grinding until you eventually wore your enemy down. Um, but unfortunately, in this context, grinding means, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of men being killed um, every step of the way. I did some maths on it once and I worked out that one man was killed or wounded for every inch of ground that was gained during the Battle of the Somme. <laughs> so on a personal level, it doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't bode well. Um, but having said that, the way I look at the Battle of the Somme is that what the Somme absolutely did was demonstrated that the Germans would not win the First World War. If you have to say what was the point where the Germans accepted the fact that they were not going to win this war in terms of they were not going to capture Paris, they were not going to conquer France like they did in the Second World War. What was the point where the Germans knew that they couldn't win this war? It was the Battle of the Somme. And so the Battle of the Somme really exhausted the Germans. It exhausted the French and British as well, but it also exhausted the Germans. And the Germans then, realising that they couldn't win the First World War in the way that they had wanted to, just basically went on the absolute defensive and um, and were effectively then saying, well, you know, we, we've captured this part of France. You, if you want us to leave, you have to kick us out. And so that then defined this process we saw for the next um, couple of years of war where the Allies were always on the offensive and not always, but mostly on the, always on the offensive and the Germans were then defending. So to that end, um, the Battle of the Somme was absolutely vital because it it marked the end of German ambitions to win the First World War. Um, and, you know, so I, I, think it was, I think it was a battle that absolutely had to be fought and I think it was successful from the Allied point of view. So in that regard, yes, you could say it was a victory, um, but it's still quite controversial. Yeah, abs- absolutely. And from what you've just stated and said, that in uh, it's a cruel way to look at the Battle of the Somme, but the, the casualties and the, and the death toll is justified. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm, I'm not one that subscribes to the theory of the futility of the First World War. I think the First World War absolutely had to be fought, um, not just by the British and French and Russians, but by the Australians as well. We had very good reasons for participating in the First World War. Um, and it's just the nature of that war. When you have a war where modern technology, you know, the, 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 the technology that they used in the First World War is the same technology we use today. Tanks, aircraft, machine guns, flamethrowers, the technology that was invented during the First World War is the same technology that we use today. And I've heard it said that in 1914, a soldier from the Battle of Waterloo would recognise the tactics and the, and the way the, uh, the armies were equipped in 1914. By 1918, a modern soldier would recognise what they were doing because it was very much a war by 1918 of, of fire, movement, support, aircraft, tanks, all the things we associate with a modern battlefield. So when you take all that and put it in just such a compressed area... I mean, the, the area of the Western Front is absolutely tiny. And when you just put so many men, literally millions of men, tens of millions of men in this tiny, tiny, tiny space with all this technology of destruction, the death toll is always going to be huge. And the Germans were incredibly well dug in and they were not going anywhere. And apart from just sitting around waiting for them to die of old age, there was really no alternative except to launch attacks against them. And unfortunately, when you launch attacks against an entrenched enemy, who is very well equipped with the latest technology, a lot of men are going to die. And so I'm not saying that mistakes weren't made during the First World War and during the Battle of the Somme. I'm not saying that mistakes weren't made. Of course they were. Um, we hear this discussion about a learning curve and that, that in elements that is true. Um, but at the end of the day, there was no alternative it, to, to force the Germans out of France to win a military victory against the Germans. You had to attack them and to attack entrenched positions against machine guns with infantry is going to result in lots of men being uh, killed or wounded. It's it's the sad reality of the First World War. It doesn't change the horror of it. I would never move away from that. It's absolutely horrific what we talk about. But if we talk about strategy and tactics, I mean, if you look at it, there, there, there was really no alternative except to attack and to, to try and defeat the Germans. And let's not forget, which we did. We did win this war. The Germans didn't die of old age and just pack up and go home. We soundly defeated the Germans two years after the, the Battle of the Somme took place. So, you know, so it was a war, in my opinion, that was definitely worth fighting. Um, and it was, um, you know, the, the Battle of the Somme, um, as ghastly as it was, did achieve our aims in, in eventually defeating the Germans. That's a great point that you that you make there. And so, do you? It was a very long. It was a very long winded answer <laughs> to a short question. But that, I think you know me better well enough by now, mate, to know that that's uh, that's kind of how I go. Oh, mate, no, that for the listeners, that's that's terrific because it actually paints a picture of it 
tells the story of what the Somme, what the Somme battle was like. And I was going to say for the, like, well, obviously there's a lot of criticism towards generals and during the First World War. And like the soldiers themselves, they were learning on the job as well, weren't they? Yeah, they were. I mean, I think we overplay a little bit this idea of a learning curve. The, 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 I think the injustice we do to the generals is this suggestion that they weren't aware of technology, you know, that Haig didn't like machine guns and, you know, that generals were the last people to recognise tanks and as if it was the, the privates in the front line that were recognising it. I mean, that's ridiculous. The, 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 the idea to implement new technology was coming from the top down, you know, and, when, and generals were always assessing new technology and coming up with innovative ways that it could be used in an attack. Um, so, yeah, so I think that the idea that, that we give the general such a hard time during the war and, you know, the chateau general who wouldn't leave the comfort of his chateau to come and see the troops, I think all that's um, quite ridiculous in a lot of ways. That There were good generals and there were terrible generals during the First World War, as there have been in every war. The, some generals are great and some are terrible. Um, but to tarnish them all by saying they were all terrible and cowards and wouldn't get into the front line is, is a little bit crazy. And, I mean, you've heard me, Adam, talk before about the concept of the Chateau General and why I think that's all a bit ridiculous. Um, but, um, you know, I think that I think the generals um, get a hard time and, um, you know, and we should take another look at exactly what they achieved. At the end of the day, we won the First World War and we won the First World War because of the, leaderships of, the leadership of the generals who, who made it happen, so... Oh, absolutely, and and like like you've said, and like I've heard other historians say, generals didn't want to get their men. They didn't want to see them killed because they've spent so much time training them that if that man was to die, then all that training they've got to start again with another with fresh troops. So the the idea that a general he just wanted to see as many of his division slaughtered is, I think, it's absolute rubbish. Well, it doesn't even it doesn't even make any sense. Like, why would anyone with a finite resource that they're in charge of doing? Like, you, you think about any person that goes off to do their job every day. You have resources that you need to get your job done. Why would you want to squander those? It's just it doesn't even really pass the logic test. Um, the the reality of the situation is that generals, to be a good general, you have to be willing to face the fact that when you give orders, a lot of men are going to die. That's the same in every war. That and, and you can't be a good general without just owning that fact that you know you make decisions on the battlefield men are going to die because of those decisions so i I think we have to create a distinction between the general who loved his men so much he couldn't bear the sight of them being killed no general in any war thinks like that about his men but having said that they do they do know that their men are the only ingredient that they need to win the war and so that you know they're going to preserve them as best they can i mean i spoke to dave sabin who was a lieutenant at um long tan in vietnam and i spoke to him on my podcast uh, last year and it was interesting to hear the way he spoke about his men. So he's a, he was only a platoon commander, so he's only talking about 30 guys under his command compared to the hundreds of thousands that a general could have under their command. But it was still the same thing, that the way that officers look at their men. And he said that during the entire Battle of Long Tan, he was focused on how many rifles did he have in operation because that was what was making his force effective, was how many men did he have to fire their rifles. Uh, and that was how he viewed. And I asked him the question. I said, when your men started to be killed and wounded, did you feel you know, emotional about that fact? And he said, well, absolutely not at the time. Every time I saw a man killed or wounded, I thought, okay, well, that's one less rifle I have to do the job that I've set out to do. Um, he said, after the battle, you started to feel those, those feelings of loss. Um, but at the time, you, you are looking at them as a resource that you have to manage as well as you possibly can to complete your objective, which is to, to win that battle or to, to win the war. Um, and every every officer who has ever served um, thinks that way about the men under his command. So none of them want to squander the lives of those men, whether it's simply because they're a nice person and doesn't want to see people die, or probably more realistically that they don't want that resource to be uh, to be weakened. Um, generals do not want their men to die. They want their men to succeed with the minimum number of casualties possible. You, mate, you've answered that brilliantly. Like that, it's it's exactly right. That's we've learned that from through history. And uh, I should actually say to the listeners, the reason I chose Posiers today to talk about is I actually, I, on a personal, it's personal for me. I actually had two of my family members killed in Posiers. One, my great great uncle he was killed on the first day at Poziers he was in the second battalion and my other great great uncle my first great great uncle his cousin he was killed on the 25th 
and he was in the 27th Battalion. So that's uh, essentially why I got Matt on to talk about the Battle of Poziers. And Matt, you and I, I um, I've been lucky enough to go to Poziers with you. And you do feel, when you walk that battle, you, you do feel that you're walking with the ghosts. And it's, it's special, isn't it? It's a real special battlefield to walk. Yeah, it absolutely is. It's, I mean, even though it's small in terms of the number of men that were served there and were killed there, it's it's relatively large for a First World War battlefield. There's there's a there's a lot of area to cover, um, and it's relatively unchanged from the war. I mean, it's it's you know obviously the, the the destruction of the First World War is long gone. It's all farmers' fields now. The village is rebuilt. It's a pretty little village, um, but there's still enough there that you can walk in the footsteps of the Anzacs. And we did that, mate, when we went up the, the sunken road known as Dead Man's Road. We walked up to the village, um, which was pretty special, and found a grenade lying on the side of the road, left over from 1916. Um, so you can still walk literally in the footsteps of these soldiers and you can walk out across the fields. And, and I've always loved that about Pozier is that if you get there in a day when the farmer has cleared the fields and there's no crops in the fields, you can go out and walk. Um, across these battlefields and you find so much stuff left over from the fighting so many particularly chunks of high explosive shell because there's just so much shell fire going on there and you know I found human bones when I've been walking across the fields at Pozier I found um, a full um, a full like uh, ammo a leather uh, ammo carrier that a soldier had, you know either lost or dropped during the fighting um, badges bullets just incredible stuff that you just find out there because there's just such an intensity of fighting in such a small area. So it's it's a really there is something quite quite emotional about walking that battlefield. And you're right, you do feel like you're walking with ghosts and the memorials there are great. It's just a it's a it's a battlefield that just I can visit time and time again. It's absolutely fantastic. Just on that point where you said the leather ammo that's that's a very rare piece because obviously as you know, they went to they changed after Poziers. They went uh, away from the leather ammo pouches. Yeah, it was a, it was a um it was really good. The the I was there in about 2000 and Three or 2004 I think it was um, and I just come I was living in London at the time and had just come over for the weekend to just go and spend some time and I walked the entire battlefield including the the assembly area and the approach areas so it was a great day in the in the rain and the mist and the fog it was quite cold um, but I remember I was walking around the site of where those trenches were I described OG1 and OG2 and and I was just I was looking just for relics from the battle you know I wasn't collecting them I just wanted to walk and see if I could find anything left over from the battle and I, as I said I found some human bones not not a skeleton, but just isolated, you know, like a leg bone and a finger bone and things like that you tend to find on the Battle of the Somme. It's pretty gruesome. Um, and lots of shell shards and bits and pieces. I was finding quite a bit of stuff. And I said to myself, just lift your head up, Matt. You're standing here with your head down. You should be lifting your head up and looking around. And just you should look around and, and soak in where you are. And so I lifted my head up. And as I just glanced around about two feet to my left, where I would have completely missed had I been just walk, been walking with my head down, was this leather, this leather kit sticking out of the ground um, and it had been run over by a tractor so it was in pretty poor shape um, but it still had a couple of rounds of ammunition left in one of the pouches and as you said it was leather and you're quite right what we know is that the Australians wore this leather gear the, 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 the gear that the Australians wore or the gear that the British wore that the Australian stuff was based on was made out of cloth webbing but there was a shortage of cloth in Australia at the start of the war so we, what we had a lot of was leather so we made the same gear that the British were wearing but we made our own version out of leather and that was fine at Gallipoli where it was dry and, and hot and warm and the leather actually went pretty well. But when we got to France, so the guys who'd been in Gallipoli wearing this kit then brought it with them when they came to France. Um, and it didn't work very well at all in France in the cold and the wet and the damp. Um, and it tended to shrink and the size changed and it warped and it, it didn't work very well at all. So in pretty short order, they then switched to the British style of, um, of, of webbing. Um, so yeah, so it was pretty amazing to find that leather kit which had only been worn at from El and Pozier effectively on the Western Front and to think that whoever wore that and lost it um, had potentially worn it at Gallipoli um, before he'd come over to Pozier and where I found it in the side of the German trenches meant that no one would have just taken it off and dumped it there casually just for the heck of it. He would have lost that because either he was killed um, or he was wounded so his mates took it off him as they were treating his wounds. So, so almost certainly the man that wore that um, did not have a very uh, pleasant end during his time at Pozier. Very, um, very emotional to have that. That was one thing. I, d I don't normally keep things from the battlefield, but that was something I did. Uh, I did take home with me, and I've still got it on my shelf at home. That's that's 
that's a it's a treasured piece in your collection, mate. And I, obviously, as I said, I've walked with you, and I know that you don't you aren't a collector very much. So for you to have that, it's a very special piece. Yeah, I, I, I tend, if I find something personal, I tend to take it with me because firstly, these things don't last once they're exposed to the air. So, you know, that, that bandolier would have been, um, you know, destroyed the next time the farmer drove around in his tractor or, you know, with wind and rain, that would have been gone pretty quickly. Um, and also it's a personal connection to the blokes that were there. So, um, it, uh, yeah, it's always, um, yeah. So occasionally when, I've, when I have picked up something from the battlefield, it's because there's some sort of personal connection with a soldier that carried it, which I think is really important. Oh, absolutely. It's, it brings the emotion into what what you do as a job, mate. Absolutely. And was there many prisoners taken in Poziers? No, it wasn't a battle um, that... Um, typically, when you see lots of prisoners taken, it's because ground is lost. So you see an attack that either is unsuccessful and so the attacking force is then repulsed and they leave men behind in the enemy positions or there's a big action from the enemy um, which results in, in us losing our ground, and so then lots of men are taken prisoner. So we, we took a number of German prisoners um, during the time, you know, capturing parts of the village. Not, not a large number, but some German prisoners were taken. Um, but no, because of the nature of the fighting, it wasn't a battle where, um, where the Australians lost a lot of men taken prisoner. We tend to... Um, prisoners from the First World War on the Western Front tend to be associated... Well, really, with two very big actions, we're responsible for most of the prisoners um, taken on the Western Front. That was the Battle of Fromel in, at, uh, in July 19 and 20, 1916, because exactly what I said, um, that the Australians captured the German positions but weren't able to hold them. So when the Germans then flooded back into their own trenches, they, they took lots of Aussies prisoner. Um, and also the Battle of Bulacore in 1917, because of exactly the same reason, the, uh, the, the first Battle of Bulacore in April. 1917 for the same reason that um and i think the numbers i think 1100 men were captured at first bullet corps which was the most australians uh, taken in a single action until the fall of singapore in the second world war so um aaron pegram who i think you're going to have on the show at some stage has just written an amazing book about australian prisoners captured on the western front i think there's about 3,000 um that australians were captured during the course of the war um on the western front so quite a remarkable investigation into part of the story that we um you know, we don't really know very well. And of course, those two battles, Fromel and Bulacore, um, were responsible for about 1,500 of those 3,000 men that were taken prisoner during the entire war. So it shows uh, how disproportionate the um, the number of prisoners were at those um, those two battles. Oh, absolutely. Was there a lot of trench raids and or was it just men going over the top and just pushing inch by inch and just trying to get OG1 and OG2? Yeah, pretty much that. It was just slogging forward bit by bit. So artillery fire coming down and the men attacking, holding whatever ground they can, digging in into their new positions and then launching the next attack from that spot. So raiding, as, as we talk about in the First World War, you tend to see in sectors where there's not fighting taking place at the time. So we tend to talk about raiding when there are two trenches facing each other with no man's land in between and then there's no major attack going on at the time. So in order to find out who the enemy is opposite you to take prisoners, to get intelligence, to assess what sort of defences the enemy has. Um, the way you do that is by raiding those trenches, which is basically a very small, short attack, which is not designed to hold ground. It's designed just to get information, get prisoners, and get out of there again. So so virtually like the nursery sector when, when we came into the line on the Western Front. Yeah, that's right. The start of 1916 was a time of a huge amount of raiding by the Australians to go and um, really give the Germans a hard time, keep them on their toes, get prisoners, get intelligence, assess what the defences were. So that um, that early months, or the or sort of from sort of March, April, May, nineteen sixteen, um, was when we really think about raiding on a large scale. And then again, of course, in nineteen eighteen, the the very Australian uh, technique of raiding, known as peaceful penetration, when the Australians carried out a lot of raids and actually snuck their line forward bit by bit by um, by capturing small sections of the German line through through well organised raids. So, um, but no, that was not the nature of the fighting at Pozier. Pozier was send in thousands of men to slog their way forward, hand to hand combat, inch their way forward as much as they could, and then dig in wherever they ended that advance. And then the next group of men would come in and start from that position, and they would then inch their way forward. So that was very much the uh, the slog fest that was Pozier. So do we, obviously, with with your studies, Matt, do we know the German divisions that were actually at Poziers? Do we, do we actually have what units the Anzacs actually fought against? 
Oh yeah, there's there's great research that's been done um, both by the Germans themselves and then um, scholars from the Allied side in in later years. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but it's um it's I mean Charles Bean did great research into the German side of things when he wrote the official history. So at the end, always when you read the official history, an account of a battle that the Australians were involved in, the last several pages or the last chapter of any description of that action is the same action from the German perspective. Um, and so Charles Bean did do quite a bit of research into the German um, activities. So it's it's listed in the official history what units faced us uh, at Pozier. Um, although Charles Bean was limited in the records that he could get to. But in later years, the Germans themselves released um, quite comprehensive histories. And then there's a number of scholars that have um, done great work, Jack Sheldon and a number of other scholars that have done great work um, into the German side of things as well. So, yeah, we've got a fairly good... Um, a good uh, understanding of what the Germans were up to at Pozier and indeed all the battles on the Western Front. Like you said, Char- Charles Bean wrote in his official history that Pozier Ridge was more densely sown with Australian sacrifice than any other place on earth, 23,000 like you stated earlier on in, in the discussion. Do you agree with his statement? Because you've obviously walked that ground and you know that it's sacred ground. Do you agree with what he what he stated? Yeah, there's no question. I mean, from a statistical point of view, it's very true that no no other action has cost Australia as many men killed or wounded in such a short period of time. So even just from a statistical point of view, it's very true. Um, but you also get that feeling from walking the ground. It is, um, you know, there's a lot of big cemeteries in the area. There's a couple of very important memorials there. It's just so well known. I mean, have a look around Australia at the number of, of parks and streets in Australian towns and cities that are named after Pozier. It used to be quite common that houses... You know, back in the 20s and 30s, if you built a new house, it was quite common to give it a name. And Pozier was a very common name for the, for the house, either because it was a returned soldier who, um, who lived in that house and, and therefore wanted to remember the most ghastly battle he'd been through. Um, or it was a family who'd lost someone at Pozier and so named the house Pozier to, uh, to remember them. So, you know, have a look, grab an old-fashioned street directory or type into Google Maps Pozier and have a look at the number of Pozier roads and Pozier avenues and Pozier streets that come up in towns all across Australia. It had a big effect. It's one of it's one of the seven major um, battles that uh, that Australia fought uh, during the First World War on the Western Front. Well, it's like you said, Matt. It's uh, if you speak of the First World War from an Australian point of view, most people remember Gallipoli, and we all know why we people know Gallipoli from El Pozieres and later on Villers Bretonne. In and if you speak to most people, those those are the main battles that they talk of. Yeah, absolutely, and probably throwing in maybe Passchendaele in 1917. Um, but yeah, these are the these are the key. Well, the, these are remembered for a reason. They're the main ones that cost the most Australians. And what we should remember about the First World War, indeed any war that's really important, is big attacks were actually quite rare occurrences in a soldier's life. So if you find a soldier who served on the Western Front, for example, the number of big attacks he would have been in during the entire war is probably only three or four. You know, he could have done two or three years of service on the Western Front um, and probably only participated in three or four really big actions. But, of course, those actions were incredibly costly. Most of his daily life was digging trenches, going on raids, carrying food up from the back line, you know, tedium, monotony, um, serving in the trenches and trying to stay alive under shell fire and not get hit by a sniper. Um, so the majority of men that were killed were killed either in a massive action like Pozier or Passchendaele or... Villas Bretno, or were just killed in the day-to-day mundane life of being in the trenches. So I read somewhere that the British, across the British line, they had a term which they referred to as wastage, and this was the number of men it took to hold a trench, to hold the British trenches when no attack was going on, and they put that figure at 5,000 men a day. So even just holding the tr- even just holding the trenches on the Western Front would cost you 5,000 men killed or wounded every day that you just hold held those trenches without even bothering to attack. Mate, that's... That figure, like I, I knew it would have been high, but f- five thousand a day—that's that's every day. Every day for three years, yeah. <laughs> this was a savage war. That, like, make no mistake, this was a savage war. Uh, I absolutely, absolutely, mate. It's. I would have thought, yeah, myself, uh, a few, you know, maybe two thousand men a day, but five thousand men a day every day. That's that's why I, I guess for you and myself, we're so passionate about studying the First World War. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, and it's battles like Pozier that give that clarity and give it focus because you can go to that site and walk the ground where this action occurred. It's been very well documented, so you can you can trace very specific actions on very small parts of the 
battlefield, and that's really what I love about Pozier. There was a very complicated battle. There was a lot of steps involved, particularly that advance from Pozier to Mukay Farm, trying to wade through the official history and understand exactly what was going on because there were no landmarks on the battlefield, so they simply marked points on the map. So you'd be, you know, an advance would be ordered to take place from point 36 to point 41, um, which is simply two points on a map. And so to try and make sense of all of this, of where people were moving and what they were trying to do, and then to walk that ground today can be quite difficult. But all in all, Pozier is a, um, you know, it's a remarkable battlefield that you, you can still walk the ground and, and walk in the footsteps of those Anzacs. Absolutely. So if people want to visit Pozier's today, what's left from the war and what can they see? Yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, in my book, Walking with the Anzacs, I described a quite a comprehensive itinerary around the battlefield because there is a lot left over. But the, the two principal things that people want to see at Pozier, uh, the two main memorials, the First Division Memorial, um, which is just on the uh, on the edge of the village. Uh, and then on the other edge of the village, just outside, is the, the windmill memorial, as it's known. And that's the remains of that windmill I described um, in, uh, in earlier in the interview, which has um, been preserved as a memorial. It was originally a memorial to the second division, um, but now it's generally an Australian memorial to, to all the Australians who fought at Pozier. So those are the two key memorials um, at Pozier that, uh, that people want to see and that they really do bring the whole battle into focus when you see those, um, when you see those, those two memorials. They're, they're really quite moving. So why was uh, so obviously our national memorial was put at Villers Bretna in uh, from our 1918 battle and do you why wasn't it why wasn't our national memorial put at Pozieres because that's where our it cost us the most of our soldiers why do you know the reason behind why the national memorial wasn't put at Pozieres I think I think Villers Bretna is a natural choice um Firstly, it was a very short action. You know, it only took place over a couple of days. I mean, really, the one day, Anzac Day. Um, you know, the, the the evening of Anzac Eve uh, in 1918. Um, you know, it was a, it was a battle that that materially, you know, affected the outcome of the war in many ways. Um, Villers Bretonneux. So yeah, Pozier was a, a a slog, a hard, difficult marathon of slogging forward. You know, and yes, we achieved our objectives, but at the end of the day, it's debatable what the bigger picture was about that objective, you know, so Villas Bretno is very clear in, in what happened. The Australians, firstly, the Australians were operating on their own at Villas Bretno. They did a great job, um, you know, in one day of fighting, which coincidentally was Anzac Day. They swept through and captured the village back from the Germans. So Villas Bretno was a great victory. I mean, Villas Bretno deserves its place as, as one of the most famous um, Australian actions and probably one of the greatest achievements of the war. Pozier, by comparison, is remembered for the hardship and the sacrifice and the, the destruction and the hanging on when anyone else would have given up. You know, that's that's what we remember about Pozier. So I think it's quite right that, um, you know, I'm sure they discussed it when they talked about where they were going to put our national memorial. But I think I, th- I certainly think there's a lot more glory at Villas Bretonneux than there was at Pozier. No, I, I tend to agree with that. And it... I, it's interesting that you brought up the windmill and there was, uh, you and I have been there. There's now a, it's a controversy, uh, this will probably be controversial, but I get really upset when, with uh, what's happened at the windmill site. It's, so I originally saw it for the private group bought the land at the, behind the windmill and actually made a memorial to the all the animals of the of the great war and i saw it before when it was when it was farmland and it was it was amazing it was it was a beautiful you looked out over the battlefield you could see you stood on the on the remains of where the where the windmill was and it's now there's there's gardens, there's trees that will eventually grow up and block the view to Tiep Val, the beautiful, and across the battlefield. And it's you've. I I'd like to get your thoughts on what what, what you feel of uh, the windmill site. Yeah, you're right. It is going to be controversial, and anyone who's heard me talk about this knows that I am very outspoken against what's going on at Pozier. And just by way of explanation is so, as we said, the Windmill Memorial is in farm fields just outside the village, about a kilometre outside the village of Pozier. And it's always since, I mean, I think it was in the 1930s that veterans turned it into a memorial to the Australian forces. So this was a place where veterans could come and remember the Battle of Pozier. In addition, there's the First Division Memorial in the town. So there's there's two very important Australian memorials at Pozier, which is more than at most battlefields where Australians fought. Um, 
And you're right, the, the, the idea for the Windmill Memorial was it was a, a relic from the battle that stood in the middle of farm fields. So you could stand on this site, stand on the mound of the windmill and look out and look out across the whole battlefield. Basically what's happened is, let, let, let me start by saying that the people who are behind this are incredibly well-intentioned. There's no question their heart is in the right place. They are hugely dedicated to making sure that Pozier is not forgotten. And I absolutely commend them for that. And the people involved have done a lot of work over decades to make sure that, for example, students learn about Pozier in their classrooms and to to raise money to help the village remember the battle, etc., etc. But it's it's gone a bit far. You have this private group now that have become zealous about Pozier at the exclusion of all other battlefields. And basically what happened is that I think it all happened because of Fromel. Everyone will recall that the mass grave that was found at Fromel in the early 2000s and then in 2010 they opened the cemetery at Fromel and reinterred 250 bodies. Fromel got a lot of attention at this time from the, from 2005 onwards. Fromel got an awful lot of attention. And I think that because of all that attention, the people who were big fans of Pozier and zealously loved the, the concept of the Battle of Pozier, I think they felt that they were that, that people had the wrong impression about 1916 and thought that the battle was all just thought that the war was all just about Fromel. So I think they got a bit protective of Pozier and the feeling that Fromel was taking all the glory and no one knew enough about Pozier. So they switched from education programs at home in Australia to wanting to do something actually on the site of the Battle of Pozier. And what happened was then the farmer who owned the land next to the windmill then sold that land. It came up for sale. And so these these Australian well-meaning private group purchased that land from the farmer. And they decided what they were going to do was build their own memorial park on the battlefield to remember the Battle of Pozier. And, I mean, I I think they're completely misguided. Even their website says you know, the, the forgotten battle of Pozier. It's just ridiculous. I mean, Pozier is renowned as one of the most famous battles on the Western Front, if not the most famous battle on the Western Front. There's two massive memorials there. It's very, very well known. But for some reason, they got this idea in their head that everyone in Australia had forgotten about the Battle of Pozier. So their solution was they were going to build a memorial park themselves. They were going to fund it themselves and raise money and they were going to build a memorial park so that Australians could come and remember the Battle of Pozier. As I said, very well intentioned, but I think the execution is misguided and dangerous because as far as I'm concerned, they are destroying the battlefield of Pozier because they are building what they call their memorial park, which, let's be honest, it's very poorly done. It's not being done in conjunction with RSLs or architects or archaeologists. The RSLs have completely disowned them because of their, their, their quite... Um, they're quite mad in some respects. No disrespect to them, but that you know they're they're very obsessed with this idea of making sure Pozier is remembered. And I'm just not a fan of the work that they're doing there. I think they're destroying the battlefield. I think I think that Pozier should be left as it is, as the as the veterans wanted it to be, which was standing on the windmill memorial and looking out over the farm fields, um, and looking out over the battlefields where all these men died. As it is now, as you say, they're putting in trees and benches and parks, and I think they're destroying the battlefield. And then they did one thing which has caused a lot of outrage was. Another group of enthusiastic yet, in my opinion, slightly misguided people decided that they were going to um, that they were going they wanted to build a memorial to the animals who'd served in the war for some reason. Good on them, but they needed somewhere to build this private memorial to animals. They couldn't find anywhere to do it. They knew that the people behind the Pozier project had land. They went to them and said, "Can we build our memorial on your land at Pozier?" And the people who now own the land at Pozier agreed to that, and they built a memorial which is quite amazingly disappointing in its amateurishness it's just it looks like a jumble sale the you know again i really don't want to sound disrespectful but it is important that we remember why we you know what we're trying to do on these battlefields and they built a memorial which is you know very amateurish and it looks terrible it's a collection of very poor sculptures some of them have been bought literally from garden centers um, and they called it the Memorial to the Animals, and they put it right next to the Windmill Memorial at Pozier. So now, behind this glorious Australian memorial that stood there as a testament to tens of thousands of men who died, and still many of whom still remain in those fields, there's now this awful Memorial to Animals, which is completely out of place. The people behind the Pozier project are now building this memorial park, which again look, is very poor in its execution, and is building on top of the battlefield. Um, that they're supposed to be remembering. So, you know, I'm, I know I'm very outspoken about this, but I just love them just to leave it alone. Just leave it alone. It doesn't need anything else. There's two wonderful memorials there. Men lie in these fields. These fields are a massive unmarked grave and they're building 
they're putting park benches and lawns and walls and memorials and planting trees, as you say. And I think they're just destroying the Pozier battlefield. So, look, I'll get off my high horse now. I am very outspoken about it, but I would love them just to please stop. Just stop building private crap on the battlefield of Pozier and leave it as it was intended to be. Um, I'm very outspoken about it. I'm like the head of the anti Pozier Development Brigade, and so I'm probably not going to make many friends from this podcast. But there you go. But no, I just I just believe it's a, it's 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 doing a disservice to the men that they claim to be respecting by building rubbish all over the tops of their graves in many cases. And so I'm I'm very strongly opposed to private development of battlefields everywhere, not just at Pozier, but Pozier is probably the worst example of when people who are well intentioned yet misguided in their in their activities can um, what they can do to a battlefield. I agree with you, Matt. Oh, look, I'm a passionate. I had a hobby that's now turned into a passion, and I I agree. I I think it's the Pozieres. It's such a it's such a special place and a special battlefield. And I I agree. I I don't. Why d- there was there was two. There, well, there still is two great memorials that are there. Why do we need to add another memorial? And why, why pick Pozieres of all places where it's our most sacred battle of uh, battlefield of World War One? Like I agree, and and mate, I know there's a lot of historians that support your uh, your views. I I know that for I know that firsthand. I've spoken to I've spoken to a few. Well, Peter Smith, one of your tour one of your tour guides on who lives in fleurs on on the battlefields and he's strongly opposed to it as well and you could even you could even bring in if you if you if you want to the soccer memorial of the 1914 uh, where the the christmas truce and that's another that's another memorial that's just it's it it it's out of place on on the battlefields it just yeah, it's not just it's not just an issue at Posier, it's an issue all across the battlefields that absolutely well-intentioned people and I would never criticize their desire to remember these actions, but they're a little bit misguided that they feel that the best way to demonstrate is to build more stuff on the battlefields. And I'm the exact opposite. Let's stop developing battlefields. Let's just leave battlefields. I mean the word is battlefield. Let's leave them as fields. It's not battle park. It's battlefield. Let's leave them as fields. The Aussies were there in the first place so that French farmers could be free to come back and farm the land that their fathers and grandfathers and for centuries they'd farmed. That was always the intention. That the, always, the, the Aussies knew they'd done well when they saw French farmers returning to farm the land that were former battlefields. And th- that's an absolutely perfect intention. Of, of it's, it's, it's the, It was what their soldiers wanted. They built their memorials to their fallen comrades and they built two beautiful memorials at Posiet. Those memorials were built by veterans. Um, they were built on the battlefield. The battlefield does not need anything else. And there's also there's an argument that says, well, those those fields were for sale, and maybe they would have put housing development on them, etc. I don't believe that's the case. I don't believe that there was all of a sudden going to be a housing boom in Pozier. But even if that was the case, even if they wanted to protect the land, fair enough, purchase the land, but then donate it to the Commonwealth War Graves or to the to, you know to Australian War Graves, so it could be preserved as a as a as an area. You know, lease it back to the farmer so that it's protected, but then the farmer can still use it for. For growing crops, I you know, just don't build rubbish on the battlefield, and that's what it is, unfortunately. And I'm being very rude here, I know, um, but it's just rubbish. Anyone that sees the photos, and most people don't like it. There's a small group of people that think it's nice, but most people that see it feel that it's out of place. It's poorly done. It's very poorly executed, and it it just is. I think it's 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 just a, such a shame. It breaks my heart to see the 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 history that you used to be able to connect with at Pozier now completely covered up by by amateurish building um but anyway i've probably said enough about it but um yeah i you know my 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 desire for the entire world is let's stop developing battlefields leave them as natural as we possibly can um whether that's governments wanting to build roads or you know wind farms or whatever it is whether it's governments wanting to build official stuff or people wanting to put houses on them i mean i know time goes on i know that we can't stop progress but Let's all strive as much as we can to preserve them as much as possible as the as the veterans themselves knew it. Oh, absolutely, and y- you obviously will we'll move on in in a sec. But like you said, there's the memorials that the official memorials that are on the Western Front are done very well. They and we've got enough of them. We don't need any more. Like you said, we we need to stop and just 
take the battlefields for what they are, which are battlefields, and they're in far- farmers' fields. So go and enjoy the battlefields as they as they are, as they were as they were intended to be once the sol- once the war came to an end. And I think, you know, there, there has been development that's happened since the war, obviously, and in the 90s in particular, Australia went on a bit of a frenzy of building memorials. But first, a couple of things about that. Firstly, it was officially sanctioned. It was sanctioned by the Australian government and funded by the Australian government. Um, and it was done to recognise Australian battlefields that up to that point had probably not been adequately recognised. And the main one, for example, was Fromel, where they built the, um, the Australian Memorial Park at Fromel. But again, very sensitively, you know, the beautiful Cobbers sculpture, you know, they preserved the the original bunkers that were on the site you know they put in information panels so you could see what was going on um also the australian national park at hamel the australian memorial park at hamel was um was another thing where they preserved trenches and you know built a large memorial to the australians who'd fought at hamel um they built a sculpture at bullecourt and made a small park on the side of the german front line but again this was because these battlefields were not marked that, that there were no memorials for visitors to come to and these were officially sanctioned memorials that the australian government designed planned in conjunction with architects and with archaeologists and learned people who knew about protecting the battlefields and designed them in a very sensitive way. And of course, in consultation with the local French people as well, in a way that would preserve the memory of the Anzacs and enhance the experience of visitors. What's going on at Pozier does not fit in with any of that. It's being done quite recklessly, I feel, by people who um, have great intentions, but um, you know are just not executing it particularly well. Anyway, Enough said. Um, it's not. It's 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 a bugbear of mine. Um, I would go on about it for you know. We could do an entire podcast about how much I hate seeing development like that go on. But as I said, you know, huge respect to them for how much they are in love with Posier and want people to remember. Um, however, it's just the execution of that of that desire for remembrance that I think is actually destroying the battlefield that they claim to love. Oh, ab- absolutely. I, I I couldn't agree more. It's it's. That's right. It's I knew it would be a controversial question to bring up to you, and I knew I knew it was a bugbear of yours. And I thought uh, you can't you can't have a discussion on Posiers and not talk about. You can't get away from you just you can't you can't get away from it. It's just one of those things that has to be spoken about. And unfortunately, it's we we are there's as you said people people love it. People, uh, people like you and I, we've seen the battlefield for what it was before the memor- uh, before they put the memorial in, and I must say I, I agree with you. I'm I'm a fan of the way the battlefield used to be. Yeah, well, let's see what happens in the future. Absolutely. So, just to sum up, Matt, do you like? Obviously, there's been a lot of history that has uh, a lot of official records that have been written on Posiers and. Do you feel like that uh, Australians back here, do you feel that they remember Posiers and the men who fought in Posiers? I'm going to say I don't think they probably do well enough. And, you know, by saying that, the, probably the people who are building all these memorials at Posier would then say, oh, OK, so we've got a point. What I think it is, is I think it's reflective of a lack of knowledge about the Western Front broadly. I don't think Australians know a lot about the Western Front. And if, if someone hasn't heard of Posier, they, they definitely haven't heard of Mons and Quentin or Menon Road or... Polygon Wood or, you know, a myriad of other famous Australian battlefields. So, yeah, I think there could always be more knowledge about what what went on on the Western Front. Um, but if people don't know about Posier, it's reflective of the fact that they don't know a lot about the Western Front in general. I think that Villas Bretno obviously has a, a very well-deserved place in our national memory because of Anzac Day and the National Memorial being there. Fromel has garnered a lot of attention uh, in recent years again quite rightly you know you find 250 Australians buried in a mass grave and then identify 150 of them with DNA that's deserving of being well known so um, you know so I think Fromel does deserve its place and yes there's there's probably a limited capacity for people to understand exactly what went on on the western front so perhaps it does push battles like Posier to the side a little bit but it's there for anyone that wants to know about it there's you know hundreds of thousands millions of words have been written about Posier and its importance there's the two wonderful memorials on the site. It's 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 not a forgotten battle in any way, shape, or form. And anyone that goes to the Western Front to walk in the footsteps of the Australians will find themselves at Posier as one of the first sites that they visit. So um, yeah, look, I'm always pushing that we could learn more. It's the same about any campaign that the Australians have been involved in. We you know we, we there's always more to learn, and I would love more people to know the name Posier off the top of their heads. But we've also got to be realistic too that um, you know it was a long time ago. 
and it's you know you and I, mate, as we said in our last interview, you and I are um, really preaching to the choir a little bit because um, for for military enthusiasts, we do know the name Posse and we have a lot of respect. Less so in the general public, but you know that's um, that's just kind of the way it is. Well, maybe maybe in the future, mate, it may grow, and because like obviously, uh, like like you said, the Western Front was it wasn't well known because people people just learnt of Gallipoli, and that was and obviously we both we've both been to Gallipoli, and and we know how sacred and special Gallipoli is, and there's so much written on Gallipoli, but like you said. There's there's three three more years of the war where the true Australian soldier was born on the Western Front. Yeah, I mean it's a great point. We lost five times as many men on the Western Front as we did at Gallipoli. And look, I, I don't think Posier is not any less known than it should be. Like it's not like there's other Western Front battles that dominate it. It's it's just it it it's in the mix of a, a bunch of Western Front battles that people don't really know that much about. And so, you know, but that's why we're here. That's why we're doing this podcast today, mate, to educate people about it. It's a fantastic story and, you know, it's, it's, and, and hopefully this encourages more people to go out and, and learn about it. So, you know, it's, it's a great story and there's lots of information. It's, it's, it's certainly not, don't, don't let anyone tell you it's a hidden battle. I have this argument, you know, with people all the time about Fromel, trying to convince people that Fromel is not a forgotten battle, or at least it wasn't before the mass grave was discovered. Um, but um, Pozier, absolutely, I mean, there's no, there's, no, there's no way anyone could construe Pozier as a forgotten battle. It's one of the most well-known Australian actions on the Western Front. So uh, it's hard to get away from. Oh, absolutely. Well, mate, I think that's a that's a good way to end the show. And, and I appreciate you coming on the show and, and giving up precious time and, and just giving the audience and telling them a little bit about uh, the Battle of Pozier. So, mate, I... Oh, mate, it's my, it's my pleasure. I never need an excuse to come and uh, rabbit on about, uh, about military history. So thank you for the opportunity. No, nah, mate, that's fantastic. Thanks, Matt. And we'll definitely get you back on the show. There's, uh, there's some... Uh, key battles that I would love to discuss with you in, in future podcasts. So, mate, thank you very much. Sounds great, mate. I look forward to it. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Adam.